In this lesson, we study the derivative as a rate of change. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at applications, um, applications where derivatives model um, the rates at which things change. Um, a lot of the applications um, deal with um, quantities that change with respect to time. At least the applications that I'm going to have us look at in this lesson will deal with um, how things are changing with respect to time. All right, so let's start with a definition for the, or an interpretation of the difference quotient. Okay, so we know the difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And we can interpret the difference quotient as the average rate of change in our function f over the interval from x to x plus h. Now, if we consider the limit of this quotient as h approaches 0, then we can interpret that as the instantaneous rate at which f is changing at the point x. So here we have um, the definition, our definition for instantaneous rate of change of our function with respect to x at a particular point in time, x naught. Um, and it's the derivative f prime at x naught is equal to the limit um, of this quotient as h approaches 0. So this um, is showing us that instantaneous rates are limits of average rates. Um, so Many times we will we'll say instantaneous, you know, rate of change. That's what we're what we mean. But a lot of times, for short, we just say rate of change, rate of change. But when we say rate of change, we mean instantaneous rate of change. So just don't let that confuse you. Sometimes if you hear rate of change, or maybe you read rate of change, um, what is really meant is instantaneous rate of change. All right, let's check out our first example. The area of a circle is related to its diameter by the following equation. We know this formula. The area of a circle is equal to pi r squared, uh, but the radius is um, exactly half the diameter. So it can be rewritten as pi times half of d squared, which is equivalent to pi over 4 times d squared. Here comes the question. How fast does the area change with respect to the diameter when the diameter is 10 meters. Let's be very clear. The rate of change that they're asking us to find is for the area. How fast does the area change? They're not asking us for what the area is. They're asking us for how fast is the area changing. So it's the rate of change of the area that we're looking for with respect to the diameter. So if we are looking for the rate of change of the area, that means we are looking for the derivative, right, um, of the area with respect to the diameter. You know what? I'm going to use this capital D for diameter. Um, I should probably change that D up here as well. So let me do that for us really quickly. I just don't want any confusion on what these letters represent. So that's a D there. Um, capital D represents the diameter of the circle. I guess I should change it here as well. All right, there. So then this is the derivative. I didn't want the lowercase d and the capital D to, you know, I, I wanna make sure that we're clear on what these um, represent. So this is the derivative of the area uh, with respect to the diameter, all right? so or the rate of change of the area with respect to the diameter. Okay, so let's do it. So it'll be equal to, now this is um, a constant. Pi over 4 is a constant, so I can just write that as pi over 4. And then we know that the derivative of uh, d squared with respect to d will be equal to 2 times d like that. So then the derivative of um, 
the area with respect to the diameter, that is the rate of change of the area with respect to the diameter, is pi times d over 2. Okay, now they're asking us uh, to, to calculate the rate of change of the area when the diameter is 10 inches. So now we can plug that in. Okay, so, and not 10 inches, I meant 10 meters. Um, all right, so here it is, the rate of change of the area with respect to the diameter when the diameter is 10 meters is pi times 10 meters all over 2, which is 5 pi meters, uh, squared meters, um, per meter, right? Okay, so it's squared meters because we're talking about the area, right? And whenever you find area, it's squared units. So this is squared meters per meter, all right? Because we're, we're finding the rate of change of the area with respect to the diameter, and the diameter is in terms of meters. All right, so um, this is the exact uh, rate of change. Um, if you punch this into the calculator and round, we get approximately 15.71 squared meters per meter. Okay, we're going to get into some really fun applications, but we need to talk about uh, motion along a line. And we need to talk about what we mean by displacement, velocity, speed, and acceleration. So a lot of times we use S to represent the position of an object that is moving along a coordinate line, usually an S axis, usually it's horizontal or a vertical axis, um, but S represents the position of that object, and the position is a function of time t. So we will say S is a function of time t, so S is f of t. Now, displacement of the object over over time is defined as follows. Now the displacement of the object over the time interval from t to t plus delta t, now remember we use this Greek letter delta to just represent the, the change in time, okay, the change in time. The displacement of the object will be delta s, which means uh, the change in the position Okay, that's what we mean by displacement, how the position of the object has changed. And it's equal to f of t plus delta t minus f of t. Now, the average velocity of the object over that time interval is, well, this is how we write average velocity. So this is a subscript with AV meaning average. The average velocity is the quotient of the displacement and the travel time, right? So the change in the position of the object over the change in time, okay? Delta S over delta T. And uh, the change in S, the change in the position of the object is this difference here. And then the denominator is the change in T. All right. Awesome. So um, besides telling how fast an object is moving, right, the velocity tells the direction of the motion. All right. So that's um, so important that we understand velocity is not just telling us um, how fast the object is moving, but it's telling us direction of the motion as well. All right, very good. Now, when we speak about speed, speed is simply the absolute value of velocity. So speed measures the rate of progress regardless of direction, okay? Regardless of direction. So the speed is the absolute value of the velocity. Let's, let's write that down. So we have speed is the absolute value of the velocity, which is the absolute value of ds dt right? So the derivative of the position function with respect to t, the derivative of the, of the position function, remember S stands for the position of the object, so the derivative of the position function with respect to time, with respect to t, that is 
that is the velocity of the object, and the absolute value of that velocity is the speed. Now for acceleration. Now, what's really interesting is the rate at which a body's velocity changes is the body's acceleration. The acceleration measures how quickly the body picks up or loses speed. Um, so here, acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time t. Let's be clear. We're saying um, velocity is the derivative of the position function. Now acceleration is the derivative of the velocity function. So if a body's position at time t is s is equal to f of t, then the body's acceleration at time t is, we can say this is acceleration as, as a function of t, it is the derivative of the velocity function with respect to t, which then means it's the second derivative of the position function with respect to t because the velocity function is the derivative of the position function, and the acceleration function is the derivative of the velocity function. So in essence, the acceleration function is just a second order derivative of the position function. All right. A dynamite blast blows a heavy rock straight up with a launch velocity of 160 feet per second. It reaches a height of s is equal to 160 t minus 16 t squared um, feet after t seconds. Here come the questions. How high does the rock go? What are the velocity and speed of the rock when it is 256 feet above the ground on the way up and on the way down? What is the acceleration of the rock at any time t during its flight? And when does the rock hit the ground again? All right, let's answer this um, a piece at a time. So let's talk about how high the rock goes. Okay, how high the rock goes. Um, so first, I would like to, for you to identify that this function is a quadratic function. Um, it's a quadratic function whose uh, leading coefficient, um, and this I'm pointing at the negative 16 because this is the second degree term, which is the highest degree term. So this is the leading coefficient, negative 16. It's negative, which means the parabola is going down. So this curve, um, this curve here is a parabolic curve that is um, downward. It's a downward opening uh, parabola. Okay, so consider the following. This is the curve, um, I just drew it really quickly, but this is the curve um, S, which is equal to 160T minus 16T squared. So I just quickly drew a parabola that's heading downward. So um, this here, this axis here, this horizontal axis would be my T axis, uh, standing for time. And then this vertical axis would be my um, S axis. Okay, so at time equal to zero seconds, the rock is on is ground level, right? At some point, the gro the rock will hit ground level again. In part A, they're asking how high the rock goes. Now, notice that the maximum height is located here. Um, it would be at the vertex of this uh, quadratic uh, function, but the the highest point though. The maximum height is here, and notice that that location is where the tangent line would be zero. Excuse me, the slope of that tangent line would be zero. So the maximum height um, can be found, right? Um, how high the rock goes can be found by finding when is the line tangent to this curve um, horizontal. That is to say, when uh, does the line tangent to the curve have a slope of zero? So in order to uh, find the slope of the tangent line here, I'm going to need to find S prime. So let's do that now. So I will, I'll try to squeeze in my work here. What I am finding is when I when I find the derivative of s, 
that's me finding the velocity function. Remember, the velocity function is the derivative of the position function. Remember, we said that. And also, the acceleration function is the derivative of the velocity function, right? So right now, we're talking about uh, finding the derivative of the position function. So that's equivalent to saying we're finding the velocity function. So um, v is equal to uh, the derivative of the position function with respect to time t. Um, so that is us finding the derivative with respect to t of 160t. Let's see if I can uh, squeeze this in here. Um, minus uh, 16t squared. Ah, sorry, I barely fit that in there. Okay, so then this is, let me see if I can create some more space here. If I can just erase this, be good. All right, cool. Um, so then this is equal to, uh, let me see if I can rewrite this. So the, the velocity function, uh, ds dt, is equal to 160 minus 32 uh, 32 T and then we're talking about feet per second feet per second this is really important everybody let's not lose this this is the velocity function okay this is the derivative of the position function with respect to time T now this here graphically speaking is giving us this this is the derivative function the derivative of the position function with respect to time t that means it's giving us the slope of this curve at any point right now you and i are looking for when is the slope equal to zero that is to say when is the line tangent to the curve horizontal well in order to find when that happens um, just set the velocity function equal to zero and solve. Let's see if I can just move this up for us. Yeah. There. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take V, right, our velocity function, and I'm going to find when is this um, equal to zero. So I'm going to set this equal to zero, right? That implies that 160 minus 32t is being set equal to zero. And I'll solve. Okay. All right. So um, that means, that implies that 32t is equal to 160. That implies that t is equal to uh, 5. And of course, we're talking about 5 seconds. So what does that mean? Well, that means at five seconds, at five seconds, I can update our picture for us. Um, at five seconds, you see that? At five seconds, the rock, uh, was this a rock? I think it's a rock, reaches the maximum height. Okay? Now, they want to know how high is that. So all I need to do is plug this number five into our position function. Can you see it up here? Remember, the position function is giving you... Um, feet above the ground so and it's in terms of t so i'm going to plug in five seconds here to get the position all right so let me move this up okay here it is so s of five would be 160 times five minus 16 times five squared uh this would be uh 800 minus uh, 16 times 25 is 400. So we just found that the maximum height, how high does the rock go? The rock will go 400 feet up into the air. All right, let's move um, on to the second question. Um, what was it? It was, what are the, the velocity and the speed of the rock? The velocity and the speed of the rock. Don't forget speed is just the absolute value of velocity. What are the velocity and the speed of the rock when it is 256 feet above the ground? 256 feet above the ground. Let me move this board up here. The first thing I think we need to do is 
find at what time, how many seconds, right? Um, will the rock be 256 feet um, above the ground? Um, because if we can find at how many seconds, right? At what point in time it's 256 feet um, above the ground, then we can evaluate our velocity, right? At those T values. So this is what I mean. S of T is giving us the position of our rock. And we want to know when is that 256? Okay, so what we do is we have a function, a quadratic function, set equal to 256. Because they want us to find the, the velocity and the acceleration, right? Or the speed, excuse me, the velocity and the speed when the rock is 256 feet above the ground. All right, so I'm, I'm finding when that occurs, when that occurs. Okay, so what we can do then is, uh, let's see, we can set this equal to zero and solve, right? So we can say uh, 16t squared minus 160t plus 256 is equal to zero. If you factor out a 16, then you have, a, uh, you have t squared minus 10t plus 16 is equal to zero. That means you have 16 times t uh, minus 8 times t minus 2 is equal to 0. That means at eight, uh, 2 seconds and at 8 seconds, the rock is 256 feet above the ground. All right. So now that we know that the rock is 256 feet above the ground, 2 seconds after the explosion and again, Eight seconds after the explosion, now we'll find the rock's velocities at these times. All right, so do you remember that our velocity function, right? Um, we found it earlier. Um, the velocity, I'll write it in, ter uh, in terms of time t. It is 160 minus 32 T. Remember that? We found that earlier. So at two seconds, the velocity, I'm just plugging that in, is 160 minus 64. So the velocity is 96, and the velocity is in terms of feet per second. Okay? So that's the velocity when the rock is 256 feet above the ground. Now, um, that's the velocity at two seconds, yeah? Now we still need to uh, find the velocity at eight seconds. So it'll be 160 minus 32 times eight, and this is 160 minus, um, what is this, 256. So this is negative 96 feet per second. So notice that at both two seconds and at eight seconds, the rock speed, the speed, remember speed is the absolute value of the velocity. So the speed is 96 feet per second. Now remember they said on the way up and on the way down, because this velocity is positive at two seconds, then um, this represents the rock on its way up. The rock is moving upward here. This velocity at 8 seconds is negative, therefore the rock is moving downward. Okay? All right, I think we're ready to move on. The next thing they ask us to find is the acceleration of the um, rock um, at any, uh, let's see if I can go back to the question. There it is. What is the acceleration of the rock at any time t during its flight? The acceleration. Okay. Remember the acceleration is the, is the derivative of the velocity function. Okay. So let me write this down. So the 
acceleration, I'll use a to represent acceleration, is the derivative of the velocity function. So therefore, uh, with respect to time, with respect to time, it'll be the derivative with respect to time of 160 minus 32t. So then the acceleration is negative 32 feet per squared second. Now, um, this is a negative acceleration. That means the acceleration is always downward. Okay. And um, it must be the effect of gravity, you know, on that rock. Okay. So as the rock rises, it slows down. And as it falls, it speeds up. Okay. Okay, folks, the last thing they ask us to find is when does the rock hit the ground? I think that's how they worded it. Let me go back to the question. Yeah, when does the rock hit the ground again? Okay, so if the, if the rock hits the ground, that means S is zero, right? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my position function, set it equal to zero, and solve. This will be um, the solution of this equation will be my answer for when the rock hits the ground. So here we go. The position function is 160t minus 16t squared. That's the position of the rock above the ground in feet. And I'm saying, when is it zero feet? When does it hit the ground? Um, let's see. You can factor out a 16t. That'll leave you with 10 minus t, which is equal to zero. So this means t is e equal to zero, um, or t is equal to uh, 10. Okay, so what does that mean? The rock is on the ground zero at zero seconds, and again, on the ground at 10 seconds later. So this is, um, let me write the units here. 10 seconds. So this would be the answer. When does the rock hit the ground again? At 10 seconds later, 10 seconds after that blast, that dynamite blast.